Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So the first Sunday of Advent, we are focused on the word hope. And hope is a word that we can all relate to in some form, fashion, or manner. So I know that Amelia was hoping this morning that little Colton would not throw a temper tantrum in the middle of baptism, right? See, I know these things. Uh, we all have different hopes. We live in a world that is full of sin and full of despair, and so we look for things to hope in. We hope that our government will make right decisions financially, militarily. We hope that our neighbors won't infringe and put too many lights up for Christmas. We hope for lots of things. Our children are hoping right now that there will be multiple gifts under the tree for them come Christmas morning. And I know some adults are hoping as well. It's not just children. We just had deer season. There are those hunters, men and women, who are hoping for that 14, 18, 22 point buck that everybody wants to ooh and ah over. We hope for all kinds of things. Some things are more serious. Uh, I have three daughters and four grandchildren, had to stop and think a minute. And so I know that every time that a woman is ready to give birth through that pregnancy and up through birth, there's always this hope that the child will be healthy, that mom will be healthy. Those are serious things. But we live in a world where there's not a lot of real hope, except for the real hope, which is in the crucified, risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Each and every one of us as Christians has hope of the greatest magnitude and of the greatest level. And again, we live in a world that where people are struggling and hoping for some of the basics just to survive in life. And I didn't get a chance to research it. I remember hearing it. It's been several years ago now. One of the, I don't know if it was a Japanese emperor, but one of the higher-ups in the Japanese government uh, made a speech to the nation, if you will. And in his speech, he kind of, gave, didn't kind of, he, ba he did say that they have no hope. The country of Japan at that time had no hope. This was not after World War II. This was more recent. And it's pretty bad when people we look up to, people we think we can count on, tell us that there is no hope. We fall into despair. We have hopelessness. And yet every Christian has hope. It's not hope of a life free of pain. It's not life free of financial issues. It's not a life free of any kind of issues. And in fact, Jesus goes to great lengths in throughout the New Testament to tell us that even though our hope is in Him and that we have a place in heaven, our sins have been forgiven. But more than once, He tells us that in this life we are going to suffer. And it makes it hard to have hope when you live in a world where you're surrounded by concrete things that give you no hope to cling to something you can't see, you can't touch with your physical hands or see with your physical eyes and hope in that. But that's what we have. So after the baptismal rite, little Colton and Cody now have hope. They have hope that God has promised through his son Jesus Christ. It's not something that Colton's going to grow up and do or say. And it's not something Cody will say or do. It's all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And that's what's going on this time in the uh, Israelites' history, if you will. There's two parts of this going on. The one we're getting ready to celebrate, which is Jesus' birth. Their hope is that God will keep the promise that he has made from the very beginning after the fall of man into sin. He promises, even though he's cursed, everybody that's involved in that, and that includes us because we're involved in it. He's also promised that he will send a Savior. He will send a Messiah that will save all those who believe. There's hope. And for almost two and a half or 3,000 years, the Israelites waited in hope. They spent 400 years in Egypt waiting for their rescue from Egypt. They spent all that time hoping and waiting for promised Messiah. Not everybody continued to hope. Some gave up. Some never hoped in the first place. But we have that promise revealed to us now in the little baby that's going to be born in Bethlehem, wrapped in rags and lying in a manger. That's our hope. 
And the scripture this morning from the Holy Gospel gives us the hope that they had as Jesus enters Jerusalem just a few days before he's going to die on the cross. They had hope. This throng of followers, how many ever it was, uh, were led to believe now by scholars it's not as big of a group as we thought it was, have been led to believe over the years. But they were excited. Here is the promised Messiah, the one we've been promised. But I imagine, just imagine, that some of them were beginning to doubt their hope when they see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a colt. He didn't come on a white steed. He didn't come bringing a whole army from heaven. He had 12 ragtag fishermen, tax collectors, and whatever that was with him. This was not what they had expected. Their hope may have been in some doubt. And then you fast forward into Good Friday. I'm sure they're clinging to every little hope that they've got that Jesus is going to all of a sudden turn this thing around and he's going to pop out and show his glory and the army will appear and everything will be right. Not so. You know the story. He was betrayed. He was arrested. His followers, his closest followers, watched him, along with his mother and some others, watched him die on a cross. What hope is there in the one who has been sent to save you as he hangs on the cross and breathes his last breath and dies? What hope can we take from that? It's difficult. Nobody will doubt that. But it all comes together on Easter Sunday morning with that empty tomb. The stone is rolled away. There is no body. Christ is alive. He has risen. He has risen indeed. That's where the hope is at. The hope is not in the baby so much in the manger. That has to happen. But the hope is in the death and the resurrection. There has to be death and there has to be resurrection in order to have hope. And it's not just hope that things will go okay. And it's not just hope that I'll get what I want. It's hope that no matter what happens. I left part of that out. It, matters, it doesn't matter what happens on the good days or the bad days. You belong to Christ. Colton belongs to Christ. Cody belongs to Christ. Those are what we cling to. That hope. And so some of you have experienced, and I am sorry that you have experienced it, but some of you have sat across from the doctor and heard that a spouse or a mother or some loved one, that they have no hope doctor gives them a week or two weeks, maybe a couple of months. But the bottom line diagnosis is there's no treatment, there's no hope. This is going to take your life. Those are hard words to hear. They are hard words to live with. But as a Christian, we still have hope. Because Christ himself died for us and rose for us so that we can have eternal life. And so in those moments especially, we cling to the promise of the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of us when the day comes. We have the greatest hope of all. It's why in the face of whatever, it used to be the Cold War, now it's terrorism or Alzheimer's or dementia or cancer, whatever it is, you have hope. And we are thankful that Colton and Cody now both have hope, have joined that family. And my prayer and the church's prayer for you is that every day you will give thanks for the hope you have in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that hope, our prayer is that you would find that relationship by listening to the gospel. And stop saying no to the gift that Christ has given you. You have hope. It's the greatest gift you'll ever be given. Cherish that, always. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.